Hello there. You're watching Ryan McElhaney with Mac Bee Buzzin. Cheers to happy and healthy bees. And today what we're going to talk about is some of my favorite apps and digital tools to harness the honey flow. Yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned for my number one favorite app, but first, by, by the way, all of the links from this video in the video description. Now, several of these tools are for informational purposes. They're things that allow us to plan ahead and get a better sense of when we can expect to see both pollen or nectar in our particular area so that we make sure we time our beekeeping with what the bees are able to find in the environment. And then a couple of these tools are apps specifically for smartphones that make it a little bit easier to identify the specific plants that are in your region, as well as keeping yourself organized for the bee season. So of course, one of the most important things in beekeeping is making sure that our bees stay healthy. There's a tool that I find particularly handy just to get a visual sense of how many uh, varroa mites are in the hive through the course of the season so that you have a real expectation in terms of when in the season varroa mites might become a real problem. So the first thing that I wanna share with you is a varroa model by Randy Oliver. It allows you to put in a starting mite count. So presumably in this situation, you're someone who actually does mite washes and you just check the population of your mites at the beginning and the end of the season. So this tool allows you to put in the starting mite count for the year and then you'll also notice that there's a treatment percent kill option in here. And during that particular point, you can actually put in an expected percent threshold or better yet, actually measure after the treatment to see what percentage of mite drop you actually had when you did that particular treatment. Let's say we started with 100 mites in the colony and in March 1st, we came in and we got a 60% effectiveness in whatever treatment we used. It then shows you the expected mite population at that point in time, but it also carries it forward. And you can see even with that sort of efficacy, what we could expect to be present in the hive at the end of the year, which then allows you to come in at a different time, let's say after the honey flow, for example, and you wanted to do another treatment of some sort, and let's say you got an 80% success rate at that point. Then you can actually see in terms of the overall mite population in the box, um, and so perhaps this just informs you to think what types of treatments might, might I want to use? Do I want to vary my approach in terms of how I deal with mites through the season? Maybe you want to use some drone frames in there in combination with some other things. Just thinking about overall integrated pest management in your hive. Next thing that I want to share with you is more of an information resource um, to get an idea of when pollen really becomes prevalent in your particular neck of the woods. So this tool, I'm gonna to bounce over to YouTube for a minute because this is actually embedded in a video by the Bee Supply. So the Bee Supply was formerly Texas Bee Supply. And this is actually data or a chart that they're working to put together that shows you the significant pollen flow start dates for the entire country in the United States. So if you want some sort of an idea in terms of when you can expect pollen to start to pick up and as a result the actual brood rearing in your colony to start to pick up each year, this gives you a really good estimate of when that's likely to happen. So for example in my area, somewhere around February 15th because we're right in the north central area of Texas is about when I can expect to see pollen show up. And I can tell you this year in looking at this map, it was about a week off, but that's still pretty close uh, because again, these are significant pollen flow start dates on average. So this year is a little earlier than most years for us because our winter has been relatively temperate. So I suggest that you take a look and see how close it actually mimics what you're actually seeing, not just this year, but in subsequent years as well. So again, I'm gonna link this in the description, but if you watch this video, it's at approximately minute marker 24. The next resource that I'm gonna share with you is actually from, of all places, NASA. So NASA puts together an actual map with information about plants, floral resources, trees, those sorts of things 
that are significant producers of honey in each of the regions around the United States. So if you visit the link in the description, you'll see that it'll take you to this bee foraging regions. Now at first blush, it doesn't seem like there's much here, but once you know roughly where you are on the map, the cool thing is you can actually drill into that specific area of the map and you can see a list of plants and trees that are in your area along with when they're expected typically in a normal year to begin blooming, when they end blooming, and whether they are a significant contributor of honey in your particular area. So as you're planning the honey flow, this can be an important tool or a valuable tool to look at just to get a sense of what might actually be contributing to that flow in your area. So all of this is just about being informed, right? To have a realistic expectation when pollen and when honey are gonna start flowing in our area so that all of our management processes can begin early enough to make sure we maximize that honey flow. So the next tool that I like to use is actually on a resource called beescape.org. Now, this particular tool is actually uh, created by a partnership of universities and it allows you to put in an actual physical address and get a sense of how successful that apiary might be based on data information and overlays that they have from around the country. Uh, insecticide treatments, um, what the land might be used for, uh, monoculture, uh, single crops, or if it is grazing land for cattle, those sorts of things, if they're residential, suburban areas, so all of those pieces of information go in. And so it allows you then to get a sense in terms of how successful certain apiaries that you set up might be. So let's put in an example and I'll let you see what we're talking about. So this is just me picking a random location and we'll do confirm location just to choose it. All right, so we're in Waxahachie, Texas. So this is gonna map a specific location that I put in here. You'll see that it drew the circle that we have here. And if I click to confirm that location, it's gonna take just a moment to actually process the data and information that it has. And this is what I really love. So if you look at it, it gives you scores in terms of nesting. So are there plenty of places for bees to actually build nests, build a hive? Um, what is the likely insecticide risk for that particular area? And then also it gives you a grade in terms of expected nectar flow for spring, summer, and fall. So you could see if I was gonna put an apiary in this particular area, we might have kind of low spring flow for us, which is relatively typical in this area. But then we have high summer flow and high fall flow. So that allows me to know that perhaps I have a little bit more time at the start of the season to build up. It might be a little longer before I really need to start throwing honey supers on. So I can really kind of tailor this to my needs. Now, the fun thing is if you were to take this and move it to a different spot, you can also rerun it at that point. So let's say you're scouting a couple of potential places to put an apiary. This allows you to move that to another point and see if that particular area is any better. So we see over here, if we come back to the east in Waxahachie, well, all of a sudden the insecticide risk is super high. And I can tell you why. That particular area of Waxahachie has a lot of farmland. They're growing corn, uh, soybeans, and a few other things. Um, but then you also see that because of that, because it is kind of monoculture, there's not as much in terms of forestry or open grasslands that aren't actually used for something. Um, so my spring flow is low. The summer flow is lower than mid, whereas the previous example, it was in the high category. And in fall, you see that it dropped from super high to relatively mid ranging. Now, obviously, this is taking a lot of information and data and aggregate from the United States um, specific to your region. You may see pockets where perhaps you outperform or you underperform what this is actually simulating for you. And now that we've talked about all of those things, which have largely focused on pollen and honey production, the other tool that I want to share is a little bit different. So this one is actually a, an app called Bees Plus. Now, you'll notice here there are a number of options within B+. So first of all, one of the things that I really love about B+, is this area for equipment. So if you tap equipment, you can actually come in and make an inventory of all of the items that you have for your beekeeping operation. Say, okay, I am 
Uh, I'm currently using a five frame feeder rim, so I can tap on that. I can actually drill into it and it'll actually tell me which of my hives, because I'm disciplined in using this, currently has that five frame feeder rim on it. And that is particularly helpful when I get into something like my apiaries, which is the next area that I wanna show you. So I'm gonna drill into this apiary at my home yard. And so if I scroll through, you can actually see I've got pictures and I've got information about each of my colonies. Now these component amounts that you see are the cost for the equipment that's currently dedicated to that particular colony. And then within that, the other thing that you can do with your specific colonies, which I really love, is you can actually go in and set to do's by adding a specific date and when you want to accomplish that particular to-do. So this basically gives you a checklist of any of those things that you realize you need to do down the line for a particular colony. Now, what it'll also do is you can set up to-dos for inspections, and in your inspection, you have the ability to go in and actually rate your colony for all of the metrics that you see here. What kind of a day was it? Did you see the queen, eggs, larva? Um, how was the laying pattern? What was the overall condition? You can even put in things like whether you saw supersedure cells, how much brood you saw. It really just gives you all of the available areas or information you might want to track, but you don't necessarily have to use all of them if you have other ways that work for you. The other thing that's really handy, and this is one of my favorite features about this app. So if you have apiaries and you actually go in and put your address on that particular apiary, then you can bounce over to the maps area. And the maps actually allows you to adjust the foraging range of those particular apiaries. So I'm gonna do set forage range. So obviously we don't want five, we want, let's say, three miles. So I can put in my foraging range of those apiaries and see if there's any sort of intersection with them or get a better sense of what exactly is contained within that particular foraging range. Uh, this can also be particularly useful if you happen to know where any competing uh, bee yards are. So you may want to actually set up an apiary in the app to track another uh, beekeeper in the area and plot out where their specific apiaries are and what their foraging range might be to see if there's any potential risk for crossover between your colonies and their colonies. And if you do swarm trapping of any sort, you can actually add in locations for where you put those swarm traps. And you can even put in a specific latitude longitude for that particular swarm trap. So if you are, for example, out in the country in a particular area and you might not remember exactly which tree on exactly which acre you put it on, this actually gives you the ability to put in the latitude longitude and you can pull it up on your map and actually see where those specific swarm traps were placed. The other thing that I really like on this is that it allows you to put in your hive components just like you can in an apiary. So for me, I like to vary the types of swarm traps that I have. So you can see on this example that this one is actually referencing a cooler nuke stack that I have, which is a foam, uh, styrofoam cooler trap that I made. And so then over time, I can actually see what the performance of this looks like because it'll allow you to come in later um, with those particular swarms and actually mark the day that you caught a swarm in that particular trap. So you can get a sense over time, where are the bees, which traps work, which traps don't, and then you can kind of tailor your processes over time on it. But one of the other things that I wanted to mention that you can do, which, which is also particularly handy, is you'll notice right here in the middle, there's this find. And this is actually a QR code scanner. And what this allows you to do is anytime that you set up a particular hive in your apiary, you then have the ability within that particular area to grab a QR code. So you can actually click on that QR code, figure out which size you want, and you can actually print that and put it on your hive if you so choose. And then if you're wanting to use this to track different things you do in terms of hive checks or your to-dos, any of those things that are hive specific, you can just pull out your phone and you can actually scan it. So another tool that I would like to show you is one of my all-time favorite apps, but it is Picture This. This is actually a plant scanner. 
So anytime that I see a plant, I see a flower in my particular area for the season that I want to know, what is that? Is it significant or beneficial to bees? This is the app that is my go-to. So I'm on my home screen right now, but you can see right there in the middle, you actually have the ability to tap to take a picture. So we'll look at that in just a second. But you can also go into your My Plants area and you can click on the Snap History. And so Snap History is an area that I also find particularly useful because I use this as a sort of logging what I saw at what time in the year, and it stays here so I can review it every year when I come through. So as I'm looking through here, for example, you can see that this month I took a picture of Texas blue bonnets, which hadn't yet bloomed out. I see a picture that I took and I can see that it hasn't yet bloomed out. But I could drill into Texas Blue Bonnet and I can find out a lot more information about that particular plant, when it grows, what its conditions are. There's that one. You can also come in and actually add some of your own notes. So if you want to put in some notes about this plant or about where you saw it or about the timing, whether you thought it was early or late in the season when it came in, that can also be handy for you as well. So this is really sort of a plant diary if you wanna geek out on that. If you're consistent and you use this just as kind of a diary during the year, it allows you then to do a bit of a chronolog of what plants tend to grow about the same time. But the thing that I really love is it's very rare that this app is unable to identify a plant as long as I can actually focus on the plant that I'm trying to shoot. And it's not particularly discriminatory on the part of the plant. I have success at times if I'm taking a picture of the flowers. I have success if I'm taking pictures of just bare leaves of a plant without any flowers present. I even have success if I'm just curious about a tree. Let's say you want to know if a particular tree is linden, for example. Then you can actually take a picture of the bark of the tree and it can still identify the plant as well. So this is perhaps one of my top two favorite resources as we're planning the season. If you liked this content, I'd appreciate it if you would hit that subscribe button, maybe hit the bell notification, maybe hit that thumbs up button as well. That'll help us out a lot. If you wanna see more content, feel free to comment and let us know what sorts of information and content you're interested in seeing on our channel. Um, and once again, thank you for watching Mac Be Buzzin'. I'm Ryan McElhaney and cheers to happy bees.